Hello, I'm Alan Fleury with the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences. Joining us on this episode of Unscripted is novelist Charles McNair, whose fiction is set in the historical South, but whose take on the publishing industry today reminds us of the wild, wild west. McNair serves as the books editor for Paste Magazine, and his first novel, Land of Goshen, was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. His new novel, Pickett's Charge, was published in September, and we'll share some moments of McNair reading from the text at Abbott Bookshop in Athens earlier this fall. I spoke with McNair about all things literary in the Demosthenian Hall on the UGA campus. So, um, books and readers and publishing and e-readers, the whole thing seems like it's in a great state of flux right now. That would be the F word, uh, flux, uh, indeed. I don't think that anybody that does anything that uh, has to do with print on paper really knows what their lives and what their occupations are going to be like in even 10 years. And honestly, I'm not sure that a lot of people that are in the ebook business really see through to the end game of what that medium offers. Um, recently, I have been getting you know, writers keep their antenna up all the time for, for not only what they're writing, but for uh, news and information about the world of writing. And more and more, I'm beginning to hear this drip, drip, drip of conversation about the possibilities of the internet and the novel or the book. Uh, if I say novel, please consider that to be interchangeable with the word book. Okay. Uh, it's not really a place right now where printed volumes live, uh, even in e-print. But if you consider the uh, unbelievable possibilities of the placement of novel form or book form um, publication on the internet, not just on a downloadable screen, suddenly you have the same expansion of possibility that you find uh, or that you must have found in the beginning when you were marketing a product and you realized that you could put that in online in front of trillions of people mm -hmm. and uh, magnify your, your, uh, your marketing efforts. So um, people that are writing books, I, I think both simultaneously feel more pinched by the world that has traditionally been the world of publishing and at the same time more expansive because of what just might be possible if we let go of some of the old forms. When, when you say that using the internet, do you mean uh, serialized stories like uh, went on in the why, in the Why distant serialized? Past? You click, uh, there's the novel. There, you know, how, how does one monetize that? That's a question for all the writers. It may be, you know, increasingly in the musical world, the music's free. Right. It's all the other stuff that goes with the music where they make the money. Right, and that's yeah. an interesting, that's an interesting uh, um, example because a lot of people think that the music industry probably did the wrong thing at the, at the, at the very moment where it was up for grabs. Mm -hmm. Do you think the publishing industry is doing the same thing or are they playing more of a waiting game? I can pretty well bet you that if, uh, if the New York Times had it all to do over again, that instead of putting out a free capsulized version of the news every single day that they would devise a way to make people pay for that free capsulized, that not free capsulized bit of news. And that if CNN could have a website that had their daily headlines for money instead of for free, that if they could rejigger all the equation, that's what they would have done. But that's just not how the medium went. No. It went too fast. It, it, uh, and it still is going faster than most people can predictably manage. So me, a writer, a storyteller, how do I figure out how to make a living from telling my stories? Um, if I knew that, I would be busy doing it right now. Uh, I will tell you, though, that first and foremost, and before any cart gets before any horse, you have to tell a story. You have to have a story that people are worth listening to, that find worth listening to, or that they find worth uh, paying for. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, 
and much else will follow. Threadgill would never forget what a man looked like as he died, how spastic and foolish. Threadgill's mind reeled and he closed his eyes to shut out the sight. He felt something crack and pour out inside him. A gorge rose from his stomach, hot and hard and violently sour, and he fought it down. Threadgill would go home now. He had seen enough. Now he knew. His brother was dead. He had seen the great civil war. A book is like a human being. It, it has a personality and a voice, and it has a, uh, uh, something to tell you. And just like you have something to tell me as a human being, the way you dress, the things you think, the stories you tell me, uh, the book is the same. And do you treat every person you meet the same way? Uh-uh. You, uh, you think about them intelligently, if you have intelligence, sometimes in my case it's uh, dubious. Um, but you, you try and meet the book on its terms, is what I would say. And always, though, there is judgment going on. There is, a, there is somewhere in your mind a, uh, a, 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 an idea of, again, are you in that place? Does it transport you? Does this book, uh, there's something that happens when communication occurs um, that I term, it's like this soft detonation in your head. Poems do it if they're good. It's like, boom, an insight, a realization, uh, an uncanny coming to terms with something that you didn't understand before, uh, an illumination. And that's what you really look for. And you try and talk about how each book takes you to that place and whether it gets you there or not. And that's really how I evaluate books. Um, I like to talk about the authors. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the book reviews I do, I usually have a preamble of some kind that is an issue or an idea that the book serves to examine as a lens, almost. Some larger thing, that, uh, is it, for instance, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the, the obvious bigger issue is racism. Mm -hmm. Fathers and daughters, there, there are many layers uh, that, that you could conceivably look at. But, you know, the issue of race, it's probably the greatest book on race ever written. Sometimes I think that book is too good because it has been so powerful and so pervasive that like a big tree it has shaded out other writers who might have written about race and who might have taken on the subject in a way that, that would be more aggressive or more questioning and challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, but that book has convinced a, any number of little old ladies that they were, on, they were like Harper Lee all along. Never mind that they sat on the porch and shelled peas while people toted Confederate flags down the streets and, um, you know, made, made mock of that symbol right. and, uh, and really did terrible things. It's so, interesting, really, you know, that the, the wider story of that, that she was such good friends and a confidant of Truman Capote and ha was involved in the, his, his big intellectual projects, and then that book comes just after, and it was immediately popular, is that correct? Huge, and uh, she was an instant star. Uh, there are rumors that she has worked on a second novel, but honestly, why would you? <laughs> why, why would you ever put pen to page again? I, I'm seeing, I have a great friend, and a, a fellow I really truly admire, uh, uh, a man named Charles Frazier, who wrote Cold Mountain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the great anti-war novels ever. And uh, just huge, uh, ambitious, inspired, uh, you know, a gift of a book. He wrote another book after that, didn't do quite as well. He's written a third book now, didn't do quite as well. It's a decrescendo mm. from that moment. I don't think Harper Lee wanted to face that or risk that 
or to uh, how are you ever going to do better than that? But that's just a kind of vanity, isn't it? I mean, being an artist takes a certain amount of courage. I think she had a great amount of courage and poured all of it that she cared to pour into that work. You, I, I won't fault uh, Harper Lee for not writing 10 more books and mm -hmm. for becoming uh, the lady who wrote Harper Lee, I mean, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird all that time ago and since has diminished her, uh, her literary fame with a, a series of books that didn't quite make it to that level. Pitiful, sighed a voice in the gloom. Pitiful, pitiful. Threadgill, it's terrible what y'all all have to go through down here. Threadgill Pickett twisted on his creaky bed. He felt a kind of sudden terror. He hadn't dreamed it. Who else was in his room? A lanky young man, barely more than a boy, sat before the window. He was nicely backlit by the strip of dawn under the shade. Threadgill could make out a mass of tousled hair, a cotton blouse, homespun trousers. Don't go all flippity, brother, the visitor grinned. I got good tidings. Land of Goshen, Threadgill whispered, breathed weakly. Ben? An unearthly blue light glowed in the visitor's face, but something seemed far from brotherly in that aspect. Threadgill never imagined an angel would look so, well, rough. It, it, it could be a struggle if you had a popular novel or if you had tackled a very, a very prickly subject in a novel to, to uh, not write that novel again, or even worse, I would think, is to begin to write more uh, politically about the same subject? Um, there are writers who have uh, the tremendous challenge of being so versatile that every single work they produce is, is remarkably different from the other. I think that the writer Mark Childress um, is um, an example of that. He is a Southern writer. I'll use the label now. Mm -hmm. Meaning his books have been set in the South Mm -hmm. generally with characters that have points of view that are accessible and understandable to Southern people. That said, each book has been very different. The first book was sort of a, almost a magic realism Southern novel, a uh, little bit of Southern Gothic uh, horror in it. The, the second book was a, almost a young adult book about a, a kid growing up on Mobile Bay. Uh, the third book was a um, a, tri uh, a, a tribute to the Elvis Presley story. And so because of that, there has never been uh, a, an audience, per se, that said, oh, I can't wait to lay hands on the next Mark Childress book because it's going to satisfy the same thing in me that first book did, mm -hmm. or that second book. And that's one reason why you find writers who write the same kind of book over and over, they have an audience, they are becoming a product. And don't think that I'm being critical of that, I'm not at all. I, they are doing what they need to do to answer their muse and, and their callings as literary creatures. And you know, the, the deal there is, they really do wait for the New York Times review or some big review to come in. And if that thing gets you on the front page, or if Time says, great American author, uh, then they're going to put the marketing money behind you and make the rest of it happen. You know? But really, it's sort of a, they're just taking a chance on you with that first book. And I'll tell you, I think those days are over for, for the big houses. They don't take chances anymore. If, you don't, if you're not an artist or writer that walks in and can sell 20 or 30,000 copies, you might as well go to a small press and you know, save yourself the trouble and save them the, the trouble too. And they're just big corporations and they've got people to feed and you know, lights to keep on and, and uh, they've got to make a, a, a nut every single month. And so they just go with the tried and true. It's the, you know, the corporatization of, of uh, publishing. That said, there are all sorts of nooks and crannies now for writers to get themselves into print that they never had before. And so, you know, if you want to publish a book, by God, you can publish a book. We're, just back to you as a, as a 
as a as a critic or when you write reviews of books, it sounds like you write a, you write to the author and about the book more than you write for an audience. I write for an audience more than for an author. I am not telling the author what he or she should have done. I am telling the reader what is worth reading in this book, and I'm very careful about the about what I just said to you, what's worth reading, mm -hmm. not what's wrong with it so much. Again, I'm generous. I, I, I err on the side of, of uh, the best intentions. I, I know what it is to sit and write two years or ten years on a book and finally have it come out and to have it dismissed in a single line by somebody who, you know, some a grad student from uh, you know, some college up north um, who was given the book to review and just not to his or her taste. And, uh, you know, is that fair for, for, a, for a writer, for all the time the writer spent? And so what, what I attempt to do when reviewing is to just give a fair shake. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, a, I'm a novelist myself. It matters that this person tried for two years, three years, five years to capture the truth of the universe and put it in this thing. Did they succeed as well as another writer could have? Well, not everybody is Herman Melville. Right. Did they succeed as well as they might if they'd spent two more years on it? Well, maybe not, but here's what it is. Who knows why they went to print? Right. Who knows how uh, the great example for me, uh, a writer named William Gay, who passed away recently. Mm -hmm. um, at age 50, William Gay was hanging sheetrock in houses up in nowhere, Tennessee. And he decided he wanted to be a writer. And he undertook to become a writer. He came home covered with sheetrock dust and sat in his trailer home at night and worked. And eight years later, eight years later, he published uh, his first works, and he became a celebrated example of a writer who turned into something very fine from nothing. And William Gay, I, I'm sure he is seen as a regional writer. His books are set in Tennessee. Uh, the more's the pity. Uh, a brilliant storyteller. I don't care where you're from or what what you grew up reading or. Uh, who your kin folks are. Mm -hmm. uh, if he had been in Manhattan writing those, the stories of the same quality about Manhattan, he would be as famous as John Cheever. I can also tell you that any writer from the state of Arkansas seems doomed to total obscurity, at least on the national level, celebrated maybe by fellow writers and admired greatly, but Where's the money for them? Where's the acclaim for them? Uh, a great writer, Donald Harrington, passed away recently. He wrote a dozen plus novels, all of them exceedingly fine, literary works. Uh, just knocked it out of the park with, the, with these pieces. Um, he labored against the handicap of being deaf for, mm -hmm. for most of his life and wrote these wonderful books. There he sat in Arkansas all those years, unnoticed by the literary world, except by those few writers who, who bothered to speak up for him. Uh, there's a, a writer named Brockmeyer, a younger writer from, from Arkansas. Same fate. Where, where is his name on the literary map? He's great. There is the writer Charles Portis, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, True Grit and right. Norwood. Wonderful, amazing pieces of fiction. Uh, if you go to Manhattan and ask somebody, do they know Charles Portis? If you go to L.A., have you ever heard of Charles Portis? Blank. But that bias has probably always existed, right? The, the, the coastal, if not coastal, but urban centers versus the artists from the provinces? I just think it has to do with the, the amount of eyeballs in those places, the number of readers in those places. Uh, up in the Northeast, you've got, what, 100 million people. Mm -hmm. In the LA, San Francisco, and that side of the parentheses around the United States, uh, what, maybe 50 million more readers. Those are some heavyweight demographic centers 
that just like in sports broadcasting, just like in, uh, in, in marketing of all types, because there's so many people there, the opinions are shaped for, to try and capture that many minds. Right. And so somebody that lives out in the provinces, uh, they have an uphill battle. Do you think that, that those walls are being broken down more and more now with the internet like you were talking about? I do, and, I, and again, who knows what the end game is. Still, though, if there are 100 million readers in one place who share a cultural history and who share an aesthetic about what uh, writing and storytelling should be, those writers are going to have more heft in the world of letters than the guys in the provinces. Uh, uh, you might not like it, but that's just the way it is. Is it a good idea then for maybe writers if they think they've got the gumption to move to the city? A very good question. Um, I'll tell you this about my life. I, you know, I'm not a celebrated writer. I'm a, I'm a published novelist. I was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize uh, some years ago. And in Atlanta, Georgia, I walk into places and people say, oh, there's Charles McNair, the writer. If I walked around in Brooklyn, I'm just one of three and a half million writers. Mm -hmm. And there's something that is nourishing to the writer's spirit about being recognized for what you do and for being good at something that you've taken on to be good at. So maybe for a, a one writer, it's better to stay in Atlanta and to, uh, and to enjoy that kind of feedback and positive relationship with the community. Maybe another kind of writer, uh, Brooklyn is better. They network more and better on a larger stage. Uh, the competition is fiercer. You probably learn faster. You probably broaden the subject matter that you write about and, the, uh, and you hear opinions and a raised discourse about writing and letters that you don't get walking around in a town where there aren't so many writers and there aren't, isn't such attention paid to the arts. It's almost a cliche though that, uh, but a, a, a valid one that, uh, that artists move to the city to try to make it. If you can make it there, as the song goes, uh, there are more publishing houses in those places, mm -hmm. and people buy the book, they market better, they, you know, uh, they have more substance uh, with reputation. Um, if you're a dancer, you're going to have a hard time uh, finding dance venues in uh, Mobile or Shreveport, but you'll find those venues in uh, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. in Manhattan, in Los Angeles. I think it's easy to talk about that kind of thing uh, in regard to not the art form of writing, but you know, let's look at a parallel in acting. If you want to act, well, you have to go where movies are made or where plays are given. Mm -hmm. And there's really, uh, you can build a stage in your backyard and you can be um, Lawrence Olivier. Right, right, and and I have many friends who are painters, and that's a there, there, there's a constant tug of should I go there? Should I try to should, mm -hmm. should I try to make it there? Because again, that's where the galleries are. Right, that's where the people are buying work, and it's where the attention is is uh, gained. So it's my decision. All I can do really is personalize this. My decision was to stay in Atlanta, in a nice house built in 1919. Um, and a nice neighborhood where I can walk around uh, in greenery to 10 or 12 different ethnic foods and go to a theater that's a block from my house. Now that sounds like Manhattan, doesn't it? I'm gonna write wherever I am. And if I can write where I'm comfortable, it's better. Uh, you know, I'll do better. Well, that's great. I'm really glad that you stayed down here to work. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. Thanks I, so much for coming on the show. Well, you're welcome. It's been great to talk to you. My pleasure. And, and, uh, uh, come see us in Atlanta. Will do. Right well. <laughs> this building, yeah, so it was built in the 1820s, and in 1828, there was a fellow named Robert Toombs, who you may have heard of. I know that name. Who got into a lot of trouble at the university. 
So much so that he was dismissed from the university right before graduation, 1828. And he took it upon himself that right next door to us is the uh, chapel, mm -hmm. and that's where commencement exercises were being held. Mm -hmm. And so he took it upon himself to, in true Demosthenian style, uh, camp underneath the oak that was right across from the chapel mm -hmm. and begin just some very profound and probably threatening oration. <laughs> and legend has it that everyone came out of the chapel, abandoned the commencement ceremony to listen to him. And legend also says that when he was finished speaking, lightning struck the tree. Uh -huh. And so this <laughs> stump is from the tree. Oh, I love it. The Robert Toombs Oak. Great. And so <laughs> the, the members of the debate society stand on the stump to, to declaim. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to stand on it just to say I've been there, guys. <clears throat> Ah, but, but there are infinitely more. more yeah. e everybody is a book reviewer now. So, and see, that's an interesting thing, too. You know, with all the changes going on, do you think people are reading more? I think people are reading tremendously more than ever before, but what they're reading is different. The, uh, there are a number of fascinating studies that uh, seem to indicate that by reading constant soundbite tweet-sized or email-sized messaging, that the plasticity of the brain is actually changing so that you actually cannot focus as long on, say, a, a longer work, like a novel. And some people, I mean, th these are reputable scientists that have done these studies, believe that it is actually diminishing the attention span of the people who used to read books. Now mm -hmm. they, they just don't have the patience for it. Their brain switches off because they are used, the brain, those gray folds in the cortex, they are now designed to handle sound bites. Right. A little burst and then on to the next thing. 